Welcome to the Go One More Step podcast. I'm Brian White. I'm a veteran, I'm a survivor of my brother's suicide, and I'm talking to people about overcoming challenges of all kinds. And here we are. Uh, welcome, guest num- numero uno, Jay Saunders, John, the first filmmaker, actor, guerrilla producer. That's G U E R, not G O R. That's right. That's right. I'm. Uh, I'm excited. Yeah, this is. Um, I'm excited on a lot of levels. Thank you for being so very brave to just join me in this and and see how it shakes out and put yourself out there um i i've had a lot of people when i put out a call for stories just said yeah let's let's wrap and i'm amazed um because we're talking about resilience and we're talking about getting through hard things and we're talking about a lot of times coming from environments where the stereotype and the archetype is you don't share your feelings and talk about when things are hard and stiff upper lip and iron jawed lone ranger and all that and and the number of people who have just said yeah dude i'm an open book let's talk about these really traumatic things is astounding to me um so thank you yeah absolutely you know more to say yeah let's explore this because it's it's exciting but it also is emotionally very frightening for a lot of people so we'll lean right into applauding you and thanking you for your emotional courage in this well shucks <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm 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 honored yeah so uh yeah where do you like me to go from yeah man uh so tell let's just start with the basics like tell me who you are what you are what you're about talk to me a little bit about your journey um, and, and the reason that I reached out was because we know each other professionally, uh, with, with you as a professional actor, but I'm also, um, um, a super fan of Ithaca and have been watching you try to build this, this, this foundation, which will someday become an empire. And I'm, and I'm super emotionally invested in seeing what comes next. And I also am acutely aware just from talking to you and from watching how hard a path it has been. So talk to me about this path of getting to the point where you are today and and what's going on. Sure. Uh, I am Jay Saunders. I am a writer. Uh, I'm an actor um, and filmmaker in the D.C. area. Uh, I have a wife, a six-year-old daughter, and uh I made a, a miniseries called Ithaca, uh, an adventure horror miniseries over the last eight years with my wife and my daughter uh, with zero budget called, uh, yeah, Ithaca the miniseries. And I wrote it, directed it, acted it, edited it, composed the music. Um, I did not know that. I did, yeah. Uh, so pretty much all of it storyboarding it it was just a really intense dive into just the the process of filmmaker I mean I'm an actor by trade and then just stepping out of my comfort zone to learn new territory to learn new stuff has been uh, exhilarating and fortunately uh, I was able to work with a handful of people who were um, who saw my passion and wanted to be a part of it and uh you know, volunteered their time and their resources to help me make it. Uh, Several of them were combat veterans. Uh, And it has led to further exciting opportunities, Uh, working with um, Eduardo Sanchez. He's the, the, he's famously known as the the director of the Blair Witch Project. And he's been a producer for several things on on TV now, uh, supernatural uh, on Supernatural, um, uh, Yellow Jackets, uh, Queen of the South, and uh, was able to get my stuff over to him. And he's been a big fan of the work, and has uh, it led to another opportunity where I am 
working with a studio that I will be uh, writing and directing and hopefully acting in my own feature length movie. I've been working on that for the last uh, the last year. And uh, during this entire process, yeah, since uh, since 1998, coming to the States, I've dealt with a lot of uh, mental health issues, uh, battling with depressive disorder, uh, major depressive disorder, as well as mania, uh, suicidal ideations, suicidal attempts, uh, and several, uh, you know, a couple um, inpatient treatments at um, mental health facilities. Um, and I experienced the worst of it back in 2019. Um, and that's when my mental health issues were officially diagnosed. Um, but since then, yeah, uh, I've, uh, I've found several different coping mechanisms, um, that have kept me healthy, uh, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Um, so where in all this timeline do you think this stuff started to manifest and we were and it, exploring causes is, is, is silly. Uh, there's, there's almost never one precipitating event. It's, it's usually a, a, a combination of things, but w w when did you and others around you start to notice the effects and the, and, and that there was an issue? Uh, 2019 is, uh, well, when I first came to the country back in 1998, that was a big, huge culture shock. I, you know, grew up in Indonesia, um, went to an international school. It was the second largest international school in the world, yeah. so it was just surrounded by a lot of people. And uh, we had to leave the country due to the um, when well, my sister was graduating, but also there was a huge, huge riot. Um, the 1,700 people died in a, in, in two days. Um, a student was shot. And it the, the whole city just rose up. This was in Jakarta. And this was in Jakarta, Indonesia, and there was a, a student uh, a, a demonstration, and one of the students was shot by a, a sniper, if I recall. And the whole city just erupted, and everyone fled the country. Uh, all the expats all fled the country, and my family would just sort of hunkered down uh, in our house to wait for things to blow over. But with that immediate cut of uh, a social, um, you know, of, of, for, of all the people that you grew up with, right. just not being able to have any connection with them. Internet was still very, very fresh. So people right. didn't really quite have email. Um, and there was so much uncertainty with people fleeing the country. Well, how am I going to get in touch with you? Uh, you know, I only, rem I only remember your home number. Uh, where, where, well, where the hell are you going to go? Um, so coming over to the U.S. was a huge culture shock for my entire family, and uh, it was not no longer having that that social support that I was used to. Going to an extremely small private school with a graduating class of I don't know, it, it felt like fifty people, wow. um, was just a huge change. And how old were you when you moved? I was. I can't remember, maybe 14 or 15. Okay, yeah. And uh, with my father had passed away very, very shortly after. So, you know, when you're dealing with all that stuff in high school and all the emotions and you don't know how to process it, you it, it was just too much. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, 2019 that a lot of these things started really, really kicking up again um, and started causing a lot of... Uh, you know, it, it was, uh, I started really feeling it physically. Mm -hmm. Um, people at work started to notice, um, it was uh, a lot of issues with, with sleeping. Um, the workload was too much. Um, and it was definitely causing a lot of stress in, uh, my relationship with my wife and, um, trying to hide all of that from my daughter was, yeah was was challenging and then sure enough once the uh the pandemic hit it just led to immediate isolation once again yeah. um but like i said since then there were there had been um once we were able to officially diagnose what i was going through um we at least were able to come up with several plans and options of uh you know 
what the best treatment would be for me. Um, you know, and uh, a number of those were, um, you know, one of the most important things were uh, the a couple of combat veterans who are who are dear friends who, you know, literally picked me up off the floor. They would show up at our at my at my place and and take me out or they'd invite me over um you know when you have guys like that who don't minimize what you're going through um that was tremendous uh because it was something that I was very very reluctant to, to share with anybody um you know making sure that I was uh that I was going to therapy getting on the right meds and that took a lot of time to find the the exact cocktail of what uh, what I needed um and through that therapy you know through that therapy I was able to come up with several different plans of of uh you know what I needed to do to to make sure that I was uh you know communicating what was going on to my wife mm -hmm. uh taking care of taking care of myself mentally and physically and um just coming up with several different plans just uh, which was um something that i had never dealt with since yeah. like i said since since 98 so through all of this through all of the diagnosis and the treatment and and people and friends coming over to literally pick you up and 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 carry you to where you needed to be you're also working a husband a father so this this was all extra. This wasn't just you in the wilderness alone. Right. And that was the big thing. It was, uh, you know, overwork was was a big part of it. And uh, Devin and I, we had to sit down and, um, you know, take a look at our schedules and say, hey, we need to make some really big changes because you are you're doing way too much right now. Um, and, you know, you're not having enough time for yourself or self-care. Um, you're, you're not able to, to do the things that, that bring you any sort of joy. Um, you know, your interest level is for, for things has just declined. Um, you know, it was, it was everything. It was the whole Siggy Caps right. uh, thing. It was everything from, 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 uh, uh, geez, if I can even remember Siggy Caps, um, you know, it was uh, it was sleep. It was feeling guilt. There was concentration that was affected, the appetite that was affected, the psychomotor skills, and uh, you know, being able to to pinpoint exactly all all the symptoms was um, you know was was extremely helpful for us to be able to uh, at least be able to name what was going on and sure. be on the same page. Okay, so uh, and and that's a that's a very common thing that you hear in um, it, especially like in mindfulness based meditation and and mindfulness based therapy and and mindfulness techniques is is acknowledging and naming, um, and and identifying triggers and responses. Um, so so it's really interesting to hear that coming out with with the acronym with the Siggy Cap and and that you were consciously doing that. What other kind of like in addition to the meds and and the and the formal treatment protocols, what did you find specific to you helped in the smaller moments? Yeah, so um, I mean, there is uh, one of the hard things was the 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 interest. Um, I mean, that was also part of Siggy Caps, just the interest in being around other people. Yeah. Um, so much isolation that, um, you know, when it was very difficult for me to, um, you know, to, 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 to get out of bed, I had to make small goals for myself, um, that I was going to, I was, you know, I was going to go to the grocery store. I was going to come to five people and I'm going to notice their eye color. Right. Okay. Then I would do the next day. All right, I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to look at the jewelry of five people and make a comment. Um, it was this slow process of yeah. of just getting back into society and and talking with people. And I had to start super super small. Um, and finally saying, okay, I'm going to I'm going to go out to a bar. 
and I'm going to start conversations with people. I'm going to tell, I'm going to meet with five different people and tell, tell a story. And I'm not going to drink any alcohol. I'm just going to drink water. Um, so it, it was setting these small goals for myself um, over several, several weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the other things that I did was, um, you know, I, I, you'll, you'll, you'll hear people say, Hey, why don't you go look in yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I love you yeah. or uh, look in the mirror and say, I'm happy with myself. And there was something that seemed so idiotic about that at the time. And I just couldn't, I couldn't look in my mirror and, and say any of those things because it just didn't resonate at all. Right. So for me, I had to find the affirmations that, you know, that did affect me. I I'd had to visualize, you know, Denzel Washington saying these things to me, drilling these affirmations into my head and being amped up for it. I had to find the right vocabulary that hit me in the gut the right way. Um, and I would write all those down and I, I've got them pasted up on my wall. Um, there was uh, this sort of radical acceptance that I needed to have about things that had happened in the past and things that are in my control and things that aren't in my control. And I had to view those sort of uh, at a distance, at this sort of black and white distance that um, there was a lot of uh, time that I spent uh, visualizing myself in in a theater and watching these particular stories in my life through black and white, and then being able to say, okay, now you have the control to to view that story again, but let's go ahead and just paint it with huge, huge bright colors, you know, and uh, whether it was the moment of trauma that happened, you know, okay, let's look at that through through huge bright colors. Okay, the thing that that person said or did, let's go ahead and exaggerate their nose. Let's sort, let's run it back and forth. And it was this whole process of viewing the past in a completely different light that when you're reintroducing that to yourself over and over, it doesn't hit you as hard as it did. And it doesn't feel so disjointed either. It, it you know, there's, there's a story to it and maybe things aren't quite as black and white as you see um or as you thought as you thought they were you're able to see the the whole picture um so i had to do a lot of that training for myself and then it got to the point where i had to really work on just you know the the law of attraction it was being able to to view success in in a different way for myself being able to to feel that those things that i want into my life that those things that i want in my life are are here right now and not not just in a way where i can mentally think about it but that i'm feeling that success feeling the joy of that um and i'd have to do that you know i still do that for for 10 minutes every single day so that i'm starting the day out in a way where uh, I'm not so burdened with this negative mental thinking with this, you know, you know, this, um, uh, you know, not, not restarting that negative rewiring in my head. Um, so, so, you know, those were the things that uh, I, I needed to focus on. And another big thing was figuring out what my why was. And uh, for me, it it's it it was my family. It's my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she has seen me bits of me at my worst, and seen how it has affected my wife. And um, you know, I, I I knew I had to keep on this path of taking care of myself because. God forbid any of my mental health issues get passed down to her, or even if you know. If, whether she's going through the roughest time in her life, whether she's aiming for something and she just fails miserably, or whether she's in a high school and she's she's dealing with all of those social pressures, you know, she needs to be able to feel like she can have an empathetic connection with with me and that I can communicate, um, you know, my experiences to her, or she can at least look at my experiences and say, okay, this is what I need to do.
Um, you know, if, if I don't go over the things that I feel passionate about, then I don't have a leg to stand on if she's in a tough spot. Um, and I'm telling her to, to keep pursuing your dreams, keep, keep, keep pushing through because, uh, you know, don't give up because it's hard. Right. Um, you know, so it's, uh, you know, recognizing that my mental health and uh, um, everything that was going on with me mentally and physically and emotionally, uh, that it was affecting my family and that my family depends on me to survive. Yeah. Let, let me extract a couple of points that I heard in there and and see how you feel about them. Um, and, and we'll work kind of backwards talking, talking about Jaden, your daughter. Um, what you're doing is consciously or unconsciously, and it sounds like consciously, is you are actively modeling resilience and persistence for her so that she sees you working through issues consciously and deliberately as a role model. I mean, as her father, obviously, she, she, we hope that we, that we set an example and, and act as a role model. Um, taking that backwards, who in your past or your present modeled that resilience and some of those techniques for you that you drew on? To be honest, nobody. Uh -huh. You know, I didn't have, uh, you know, coming over to the States, my, my father passed away and, um, you know, my family didn't have the tools to be able to deal with that grief right. um, or to know how to communicate it. I didn't know how to communicate that with, with, people at the hospital or people at my school, I, I did not have those tools. Mm -hmm. And it's also one of those things that, you know, you, you, you know, they're, they're, you kind of get used to that. You know, we, we still were kind of growing up in a time where there was a stigma against being able to, to yeah. really say what was going on. And, uh, you know, for me, I'm a very, I can be a very incoherent person and just didn't know how to put any of those things two words right um thankfully uh you know working with with the therapist and doing all this sort of treatment um it's uh it, like i said it gave me it gave me a path right um and just uh you know it's i feel like it's important for for Jaden to be able to see the struggles, you mm -hmm. know, to for her to be able to even hear mommy and daddy fighting, because she needs to see that when we're arguing that there is a conclusion to it, that we resolve something, that um, that we're able to 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 hold each other's hands and say, okay, we are going to extend grace to each other. Right. Um, you know, that, you know, that, um, that if mom and dad weren't having any sort of arguments, that if everything was just so, um, you know, there, there's something off <laughs> if, yeah. if, if, we, yeah, if we weren't. yeah. And, and a lot of us grew up in, in, in kind of the Stepford circumstances where all of a sudden the, the divorce announcement was made and the kids had no idea there was a problem because of that, because you, like the kid was shielded for so long and so carefully from any sign of conflict. Whereas what you're showing is conflict when love remains present can, can be healthy and productive. Right. And like I said, the big thing being the resolution, she needs yeah. to see how it comes to an end. And, uh, you know, it's funny because with the, the, with the films that I, I like to focus on with things that are involving a lot of horror, mm -hmm. um, it's having Jaden involved in those films where there's a lot of horrific things that are happening in the script and that she's going to be a part of that movie. I, I want her to see that there's a resolution at the end, yeah. that there's, there's hope in the end, that there's, there's some sort of redemption for the families. Um, because if she was watching a horror movie and, uh, you know, we just said, okay, go to bed. And right. she's left going to bed with these horrific images in her head. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I, I feel that's much more traumatizing than her being able to see that 
hey, this is how evil is defeated. This is how you you find your strength. This is how you find your courage. And um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and another thing that kind of jumped out at me, and, and it's because of my own biases and my own, and my own um, preset loves, it really hit me when you talked about doing small repetitions. And I, and I use the word repetition deliberately. Go to the grocery store and note the color of five people's eyes. The next day, note five people's jewelry and comment on it. And, and that slight build. And, that, and, that, and just working that same, for lack of a better term, that same mental and emotional muscle over and over with what we call progressive overload um, and, and in the fitness world. And I know that as a martial artist, I, I presume it had to occur to you that what was happening was you were training your brain, right? So just like Krav Maga, you start with the jab and you work the jab until the jab is natural. And then you work another, another strike in or another defense or whatever it is. And it sounded like what you were doing for a time there was one technique at a time running through stuff to build that up, to, to, to build the muscle in, in the heart and mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's one, one thing that I'm, uh, that, um, that I do pride myself on is, is discipline. Um, you know, it's, uh, and it, it's one of those things with, with, you know, with filmmaking, you have to be, you know, there's a schedule for when things have, are done. Uh, you're, you, you have a specific call time, show up to it. You have to acknowledge that. Um, and, uh, you know, it setting up a schedule for myself to do those things wasn't the hard part. It was right. just <laughs> saying, okay, I'm going to put myself out there. <laughs> and and start doing these things and uh you know just sort of desensitizing myself to the to to how challenging it could be um that was tremendously helpful and to walk away from those days and not judge myself right. for how small it was um, but to to recognize those wins and to record it down and say, this is the person that I spoke to. This is the story that I told. I shook this person's hand. Uh, I, you know, I, I spoke to, you know, if I was going out to the bar, I didn't just speak to one person, but I spoke to a group of five people. And these are the stories that I held. And this is where it led to, um, you know, and that's something where still to this day, if I'm stuck working on this computer for too long, writing, editing, Devin says, you have to get out of the house, go out, be in front of people that you don't know, and, and start those conversations. Um, and, you know, there's something to be said about, uh, you know, having a good, strong social support of people that you can trust. But for me, I needed to once I, I had that circle of people that I could trust, I need to go, I had to go out even further. Yeah. Yeah. Putting, and, and that, um, and, and I know a lot of, I know a lot of accomplished martial artists. I know a lot of veterans. I, I know a lot of people who have levels of demonstrated physical courage that are just astounding that when you say, Hey, go talk to that stranger it absolutely makes them physically shake with fear. Um, so, so doing those small things and you say desensitize, I say strengthen. Um, yeah. it, it sounds like you're working a technique and you're building a neural connection and you're, and you're, you're building an ability a tiny little bit at a time, which is kind of the whole point um in in the thinking of resilience which is just a little bit at a time each time and, and and i heard you say very early on talking about getting through discrete chunks of time one task like tackle one thing at a time like i'm, I'm gonna get up i'm gonna make breakfast today i'm gonna go to the grocery store i'm gonna talk to five people and like that's the goal that like i'm not gonna write a movie and produce it and act in it and have a seven figure deal tomorrow today i'm going to go to the grocery store and i'm going to directly interact with five human beings and that builds 
Yeah. And, uh, and it got to a point where there was just something exciting. Uh, there was something fun about that. You know, after you get over that, that nervousness and that yeah. rush, it was like, okay, well, let me call, let me call someone at the mall, yeah. one of these stores and say, okay, I'm going to get them, whoever they are to tell me what movie to watch. You know, and, and you know, I'd get on the phone and, you know, I needed to be against struggle. I needed to be against something that was going to to push me further. Um, and and then once you over overcomplish those small things, it, it just it, it, it just becomes much more exciting. Um, and like I said, it, it puts you in uh, exploring unknown territory, which I um, tremendously enjoy. Yeah, that w w what you just said, like that's a mic drop moment where you needed to struggle, you needed to have a conflict or a struggle or a challenge. Um, we we are evolved to tackle challenges to solve problems. When we get too comfortable, when we get too complacent, when life is too easy, that's when we start to see problems piling up. Um, and it's really interesting that like all of these modes of therapy, you either see a massive swing towards comfort or more often you see some introduction of deliberate discomfort under very controlled circumstances to, to just rebuild that muscle and that ability within us. Yeah. And, and you know, there's, there's the way that you, you, and I think a big thing is also when you come to those problems is the coming to it with the right perspective, how you frame it in, in your head. Um, you know, when with filmmaking, uh, as I was diving into all these different new aspects of 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 writing, of of screenwriting, of composing, of editing, um, you know, there are people who spend their whole lives just on that thing and dedicate their whole lives just to that. So the fact that I was trying to jump around all these different uh, these different aspects of filming of filmmaking um, is extremely humbling. Yeah, uh, because you're walking in someone else's shoes. Um, you're understanding, you know, why they have to dedicate all that training just to do that one thing. Um, and uh, you know, when you're when it comes to writing these stories, one of the things that I enjoy so much is, um, you know, like I said, coming out of going out of my comfort zone and learning something new with this new one with archaeology with H.P. Lovecraft, but also. Um, you know, speaking with Vietnam veterans and learning more about Vietnam, and uh, it gets you to to sit with the experts and be humbled by their stories, by their experience, and earn their trust and say, okay, well, I'm going to do my best to be able to to represent just a little bit of what you've done on on camera. Um, and like I said, it, it's humbling. So the task becomes less daunting of like, hey, I'm doing something completely new. It's, hey, I get to establish this entirely new connection with somebody. This, I get to establish this whole new bond. This is a new person in my tribe. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my favorite thing is to do that with, with veterans, with combat veterans. So... You said 2019 was when a lot of this kind of came into a, came to a head with COVID. Um, and if memory serves, that's also about the same time you started and finished at least the first chunk of Ithaca. So what's the connection there? Yeah, so uh, 2019 was uh, a very, very rough year for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, was was juggling uh, just way too much. Um, you know, got into some bad relationships. Got uh, um, was was very much overworked. Had a lot of bad advice from from the church that I was going to. Um, they were you know pretty much saying, listen, you know, put put the passions in your life away. You need to you need to work more because or you need to you need to you need to do something else because that's what a real man would do for his family. Uh, that's yeah. that's that's you know that's uh, you know to show your love for 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 God you you put your passions away and you you humbly serve Him. Um, so that was that was rough for me to just cut out the things that 
brought me joy um, and just being overworked, uh, you know, didn't have enough time to to work on on Ithaca. Um, and there was just too much, just too much happening, just too much, you know, like I said, bad relationships with 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 people. Um, it came to uh it came to a bad spot with several suicide attempts and being in uh, mental health care. Um, and one of the first things that I wanted to do when I was out, uh, I, I had thought that, okay, well, you know, it's going to bring me joy if I'm trying to think about self-care is uh, I, I want to go to Bali. I, I need to just go to Bali by myself and um I, I just need to go the day before my flight was going to leave in 2020 is when everything had shut down with covid so i i i was heartbroken by that but covid ended up being a real blessing for me mm -hmm. because it meant okay during this time of isolation i am going to i i i I know sitting on my ass and watching TV is going to be the worst thing for me. Yeah. Um, I have to do something that I am passionate about. So I was able to finish editing what we had done with Ithaca, come up with a defined uh, story. I was able to, um, to, to finish composing, finish color grading, learn these new editing uh, editing software, then get that over to Eduardo Sanchez, who I just kept on hounding him, just sending my stuff over and over and over <clears throat> and just refusing to say no. I, I told myself, okay, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to put myself out there regardless of what the critics say, what I, or what anyone else says, or what my own mental, uh, you know, own, my own negative pattern of thinking is. And from there, Ed finally saw it and was extremely impressed and said, what do you want to do with this? I said, well, I want to turn it into a TV series somehow. Okay, if you're going to try to turn this into a TV series, there's a lot of stuff that you need to do, right. which once again was a whole bunch of stuff out of my comfort zone. I needed to learn how to write a, a pilot script. I had to learn about the process of making a television series create a proof of concept, uh, create pitch documents, create an exciting pitch. So it was a constant process of, of growing and learning new things. Right. And it was a tremendous, it was a tremendous satisfaction knowing that every day you are pushing yourself to be a better you. Mm creatively um it, it, it knowing that you're stretching yourself that you're going into unknown territory that it it's um you know speaking to speaking to ed speaking to all these different combat veterans speaking to people who were uh in, in did incredible missions all over the world it was another opportunity to sit down and just listen to people and their expertise and just be humbled by the work that they do and establish, once again, establish those connections, establish those relationships, establish a sense of trust with someone, uh, you know, because you're, you're willing to listen. It, it, exciting opportunity to say, I'm going to set myself apart from other people right? by avoiding the most obvious choice, um, thinking outside the box and exploring these huge, huge concepts of, uh, of the human condition. Yeah. Um, so it, like I said, it was every single day was an opportunity to, to be the best of myself. Um, and that, 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 that's just fun. And like I said, it's now led to this opportunity where I'll, I'll be working with a studio and actually have a budget to do this feature film and be able to write, direct and act in this whole movie. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, it, it's, it's exciting. So, so on that note, can I, can I make an observation and, and I, I hate to, I, I, I really do hate to cut you off, but 
through all the times, through all that we've talked through, all of the descriptions of the various situations you found yourself in, I can't help but notice the times, and, and the reason that I stopped you at the word exciting is that the times you are the most animated and the times that you are the most forward-looking and present, even in this conversation, are the times you're talking about the times you were least comfortable. Not, not the times you were depressed, the times you were outside of your comfort zone, stretching yourself and doing things that were new and challenging to you. As, as you said, being humbled by learning all of these, these aspects of the filmmaking trade and, and understanding why a camera person can have a career as a camera person as you try to learn that. And it, it just really strikes me that the times that you were describing when you were self-described out of your depth and learning as you went and really, really, really challenged, those are the times that you're the most animated and present and positive. Yeah, it seems it, counterintuitive, but it really plays into we need to have we need to have problems to solve and challenges to overcome to truly be fulfilled and happy. You know the the reason for me that it, it's exciting was um, you know with twenty nineteen and with the intense amount of. Uh, self-hatred the self-harm the self-punishment the suicidal ideations the suicide impulses the suicide attempts there was so much about not seeing any sort of value that i had in myself yeah. it was uh you know being angry at me being angry at the world having these horrific relationships with people i just did not see the value in myself and feeling like i had just doing several things that just emasculated me um and this whole process of going up against the grain and pursuing what you're passionate about and and stepping into unknown territory and learning these new things it was uh, i was seeing more and more value in what i had to say and more of of seeing more of my character um it, it 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 was it's exciting to see that yeah. um you know and it like i said it was just this wonderful it's been this wonderful journey of just uh recognizing the value of your own point of view and that hey despite um you know that that i have an entire film to say what I believe in or the things that I value. I get to right. I get to have my thumbprint on every single bit of this. You know, when you're when you're acting, you really don't have a lot of that control. Um as an actor, you know, you have people yeah. who will cast you be either based on ethnicity or, or or whatever. You don't fit the bill. Um if you're trying to put together your demo reel, you don't have control of the the edits, the cuts, the things that look best for you. You don't have control of the story. You're you're doing someone else's passion. Um, but when you're creating an entire piece and you have, like I said, your thumbprint on every single aspect, it's just, uh, man, every day is just this exciting opportunity um to like i said demonstrate the best of yourself and to see that value in yourself and to um you know to yeah it, it's it's every day that i'm not doing it it just feels like a waste so i want to challenge you a little bit because you just gave the recipe for happiness right? You, you just gave the recipe for human happiness, which, which is step outside of yourself, take control of your destiny, you know, find your voice, tackle the challenges, all of these things for somebody not in the creative world. So, so for somebody who's watching this, who is in a nine to five and, and doesn't have that, that, that avenue, or perhaps even the desire to create an artistic expression or something like that, 
how do you bottle that? How do you how do you capture that? Because I, I'm I'm am convinced that what you found in this is what we're all looking for when it comes to that walking that path of happiness, which is never smooth and easy. You found a very challenging path to walk and a very rewarding one. So outside of the creative world, how do we find that? Yeah. You know, that's, that's a tough one. I, you know, since the, this path still is so, so new mm-hmm. for me, it's only something that I've been doing since, or, or really been aware of since, since 2019 okay. um, and, and really challenged myself since 2019. Uh, there's been so many ups and downs and so many struggles yeah. it, and it's, there hasn't been, um, I haven't had anyone to hold my hand and guide me through. So there, there's just sort of this, you know, uh, understanding that you, that you have to have to, to recognize that it's that your path, my path is going to be just completely different than yours. I had to start really, really small. I had to start with writing down a list of just the things that bring me joy Mm -hmm. Um, at the very, very beginning of 2019, after all these horrible things had happened, uh, and after all these horrible things that I was doing to myself, I had to just start with that list. Yeah. And the things that I had, the things that bring, bring me joy, the only things that I could think of. And when my friends were challenging, you know, these combat veterans, when they would challenge me on that, on the phone, just right now, tell me something that brings you joy. Mm -hmm. Tell me anything. The rug feels good under my foot. They would be, you know, rugs are fucking awesome. Tell me something else. Yeah. I've got, I like my hair. You know what? I'm fucking balding. Hair is fucking awesome. That's great. And it was just like (laughs) building off these stupid fucking small things. You know, I had to write down, okay, sitting right. What would bring me joy right now? Eating, eating a fucking s'more. And it was this, but it was this process of just feeding the things into your life, no matter how small they were, recognizing those small things that brought you some sort of, some sort of fulfillment. And from right. there, you can just start building off and making those things even grander. It, it it really was this, this process of, like I said, just starting with something small um, yeah. and not judging that. It was not, you know, not minimizing what you're going through or minimizing the things that help. Yeah. So, uh, so like on a given day when, because you're doing so much with, with Ithaca, with, with this new project and and you're involved in so many different aspects of it, right? Some have to be more entertaining than others. Some have to be more engaging than others. Any, any job, any task, especially when you, when you're covering that kind of a range. So on the days when it's pure grind, on the days when you're doing the things that do not capture your imagination at all, what gets you through it? Uh, it's it's still the excitement of the process. Hmm. As much as I can't stand it, there's there's an excitement of looking for what the solution could be. Yeah, I, like I really enjoy. So, so one of the things that I one of the thing, most important things for an actor is to have a strong not just perspective point of view of what your of what the world is but is your ability to think outside the box and make interesting choices Mm -hmm. so when i would teach one of the most important exercises that i would do is i would take a coin put it in the middle of the room and i'd have the class line up or sit around a circle and i say okay these are the rules to the exercise you need to go to the coin and interact with it in any way that you like Mm. that's all it is and then leave 
All you need to do, the only things you can't do is you can't throw the coin, you can't eat the coin. So other than that, interact with the coin, and that's it. Okay, so a person would go, they'd pick it up, put it in their pocket, and put it down. Okay, come up with a new choice. Okay, they would come up and flip the coin. Okay, come with another choice. Okay, they'd try to pick it up with their pinkies. Then they'd try to pick it up as a character. How would a crab do it? How would, how would a cowboy do it? Okay, now they turn the, the prop into a, something completely new. They turn this coin into a little DJ booth. They, they turn it into, oh, I'm going to use this to carve off the gum on my, on my shoes. And it's the most basic action. Come up with as many choices as you can over and over and over and over, nonstop. Because it's just forcing you to think outside the box and say, I'm not going to be satisfied with this one choice. There is always, always something that you can do. And, you know, it, it's, I, I always try to think about that when I'm coming to a problem. When someone says it's just not going to work, it's not going to happen, I, I just believe that there is a way to make it work. Even with the way that you say it's not going to work, there's got to be some sort of way that you can frame it. There's another way that you can look at it. There's another aspect, avenue, that can actually make that wrong choice be something that becomes actually brilliant. Um, and so when it comes to being in that grind of just, I don't want to fucking do this, I, I, I'm just having an issue here. It's just telling myself there is another way to solve this. There is another answer, and it's not going to be the most obvious one. And that's exciting because that's when you're, you're, you're really demonstrating something with your creativity. You're really taking it to some, some place that no one else has gone, or at least a place that you've never gone before. That's, that's a blast. That's when you know you're you're thinking outside the box and you're stepping into some place that's just, you know, scary, new, exhilarating. Um, so for me, that's 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 how I approach it. There, there's always an answer. There's always a way to figure this out. There's always a way to take that that wrong choice and make it something brilliant. Shit, man. I was listening for, for things that I was going to highlight and try to sum up, but that's like five mic drops in one monologue. I'm just going <laughs> to leave the hell alone. That was, that was amazing, dude. Um, yeah. So we're, we're going to cap that there. Uh, I, I'm not kidding. That, that was pure, pure platinum. Um, what's next? What should people look out for? Uh, Take a look at Ithaca the miniseries on YouTube. Check it out. Um, I, I also try to, <laughs> I've had a hard time with doing it because sometimes when I get focused on something, it's difficult for me to do anything else. But uh, Brian was actually my first guest on my podcast. <laughs> no chance that I was. Yeah, that's right. I was um, on the side of the screen. Yeah. So so those are, uh, you know, I, I, so if there's any veterans out there who who would like to share just, um, just fun, crazy stories about what they did to to kill time um i love listening to those um you know so you can take a look at my man in the arena films youtube page yep. That's you over can your find head. me on no instagram way. uh i think it's uh it's my first and last name jay saunders 333 okay. um and then we'll see about this movie the petersons yeah. site two uh, the goal is to start filming it at the end of summer, so uh, stay tuned. You'll see the process. That's fantastic, man. I'm I'm excited to see it. Um, I I I think I'm gonna go boost each of your Ithaca chapters by one watch a piece after this. And uh, don't forget to take a look at a, a cameo, a special cameo, and the proof of concept. Yeah. Yeah. Two, yeah, it's a guy, it's a guy that looks like me, only about plus 40 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, dude. Hey, um, said it before, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it a bunch of times on and offline. Thank you so much for 
the courage and and just the raw honesty of being willing to come out here and lay out that open. Um, this was awesome. It was amazing. Um, I cannot wait to, I, I almost want to have people film reaction videos to some of your mic drop moments because you really, <laughs> really, you really did just put some absolute diamonds on a rough trail that probably a lot of people are walking. So I, I hope that this gets all the looks it should because this was a really good conversation. Thanks so much for being willing to put it out there and being willing to take a chance on this, dude. Hey, thanks for having me. That was awesome. Cool.